poignant autobiography has recently been published. It describes a childhood troubled by illegitimacy and by a torn loyalty between two mothers and indeed between two worlds. The book's author, my guest tonight, has since gone on to become one of the country's most acclaimed actors. She has made her name playing strong, single-minded women from her award-winning stage performance of Edith Piaf ten years ago to her most recent portrayal of defence lawyer Catherine Hughes in the television series Blind Justice. Welcome, Jane Lapeter. Hello. Jane, can I ask you why at this time in your life, why you were prompted to examine your childhood and write your, this book? Well, for the most feeble of excuses, really, uh, Macmillan asked me to. Um, it why, all... did they know about it? Well, it came about through a conversation I had with Michael Parkinson on Desert Island Discs where I was indiscreet enough to mention that I'd been writing on and off for about 15 years, just for my own consumption. And in fact, that I'd wanted to be a writer before I was an actor. And uh, the literary agents and publishers came out of the woodwork, and I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not showing you anything. <laughs> I've never shown anyone anything I've written. And um, it was Kyle Casey of Macmillan who asked if she thought that any of my writing could be improved by getting a book about my childhood out of my system first, which I thought was an amazingly perceptive question. Do you feel that's what you did, that in, in examining your childhood you've actually got something out of your system? Well, only in terms of my future writing, if there is going to be any future writing at the moment, just having undergone the book publicity circuit, I feel I never want to pick up <laughs> a pen again. Um, because writing is such an intimate experience. And because I was a novice at it, and it was just something shared between me and the typewriter, it was the most horrendous shock to find that when the book came back from the great publishers in the sky, it was, you know, up for public grabs. It was public property. Um, no, I didn't write it in any way as a form of self-free discovery. No, no, no. But um, it is an extraordinary story. And one of the things, I think it's beautifully written and very moving. Thank you. And one of the things that intrigued me about it is that in your decision to stay with your gran and, if you like, not go with your mother, but see her, of course, but not actually go with her, you were a very young child when you made such a, a very important decision and it was a very, will, a very strong decision and I wondered whether that was the moment that led you on to this career of playing very strong, self-willed women because a 12-year-old to make that kind of decision is quite exceptional, I would have thought. Well, I suppose looking back on it, like for all children, I wasn't aware of the importance of the situation. Mm. As far as I was concerned, like all foster children, I just wanted to stay with the person who I knew loved me. I mean, most children know where they're best cared and best, best loved. But you hadn't had then a fantasy of being with your lost mother, if you like, no? You, you... Oh, yes. Oh, but you rejected that, in, in a sense, and stayed with your well, grand. Well, because I was frightened of her. Really? I didn't mm, know her. Yes. She was a stranger. And I really wrote the book. It's not strictly speaking an autobiography. I mean, Gran, Mummy Grace, is really the star of the book. And I wrote it and dedicated it to her and to foster mothers everywhere. Because I feel rather strongly that there are a lot of women who live very unpublic, unlauded lives, nurturing and caring for other people's children. And this was your tribute to her. Well, yes. it's a very lovely tribute. Thank Can you. Can we have your first book? Yes, well, this is a very lovely tribute, too. Um, a tribute by Margaret Forster. The book is called Have the Men Had Enough? And I believe this was based on her own experience, either yes. of her mother or her husband's mother. I think her husband's mother, yes. Victoria Glendinning actually had this as oh, on the programme as well. It's a very, what is its particular appeal to you? Well, of course, my foster mother also oh. went senile. This is the story of Grandma who goes senile, and this very, very caring and loving family's desperate attempts 
to keep her out of an institution and the agonies of lists and schedules and rotors of people to look after her during the night and during the day when the daughter she lives with works and the terrible problems that they have wanting to love her and wanting to care for her when her mind is wandering. Now, I was lucky in that my foster mother only went senile in the last 18 months of her life. Did you look after her then? No, she had already been in an old people's home for about 10 years. It had taken a lot of struggle and a lot of convincing on my part to get her out of the home in which she'd raised all seven of us foster girls. And I think I only finally managed to do it when I said, um, you know, it would be terrible if you fell during the night and you ended your days in a geriatric ward. At least if you go now, um, you can go to an old people's home where you can have your furniture in the room and you can, you know, ha have friends and play games and watch television and chat yes. and things. But, and was but, she happy there? Very. Now, the family in this book actually, is v some of them are very resistant to this idea. Of, of putting, her, of in putting her in a home mm. and they fight very hard. The, uh, it, That's you, what's so moving yes, about it. Yes, it is, isn't it? Is that, you know, these people don't see her, largely the family don't see her as an encumbrance. They don't see her, they loved her um, and they can remember what she was like when she was at her best. And even the young children in the family, Hannah, the book is written through the eyes of Jenny, the daughter-in-law that one imagines to be in her 40s. Would you read some for us? We'd, we'd I would, like yes. And, and also through the eyes of Hannah. Um, and, and the most wonderful bits of humour in the book arise from these terrible circular conversations <laughs> that they have with Grandma, where she starts off with a statement or a request, and bit by bit, one or other of the family try to understand what she's what talking she about, and she ends up with exactly the same statement <laughs> that she's made at the beginning. So although it's very funny, it went straight to my heart, the pain and the agony of watching someone you love Trying whose mind is wandering. Mm. And if they had a broken arm or jaundice, you could see that they were ill. But but uh, senile dementia is a very, very difficult thing to do, and she has captured this so brilliantly. Have the men had enough? Never mind the men. Which men? Oh, hurry up, the potatoes will be cold. I'd love a potato. Then take one, Grandma. Have the men had enough? Pass the salt. It's in front of you. Stick it in her hand, stick it in her mouth. Adrian! It'll ruin her taste buds. She hasn't got any. Pass the salt. Finally, when the salt has fallen like scurf, Grandma is satisfied. She eats with her hands. Paula concentrating hard on her own plate. Bridget cooing and praising and expertly pushing the potatoes out of the gravy. And we all hurry to eat before the inevitable, before Grandma says the chicken is tough. Which, of course, it isn't. But who can bother saying this when it's melting in our mouths that very minute? Then she takes her bottom teeth out. The top set are already out, lost somewhere between breakfast and lunch and likely to turn up any place from the peg basket to the biscuit tin. She uses them as a scoop, grating them through the shallows of the gravy to fish out a potato. And Adrian laughs, and Dad smiles, and Mum moves her face not a muscle and Paula closes her eyes, and Bridget snatches the teeth, rushes to the sink, sluices the teeth, and rams them back into Grandma's mouth. Wonderful. Maybe th this book, will, we, we hear all the time about the responsibility of parents, quite correctly, to their children, in a sense your book dealt with that. Do you think this could start a debate about the responsibility of children to their parents? That it's a, that, you know, there's a time in your life when having been taken care of, it is your time to be the carer. Absolutely. In fact, Hannah, the 14-year-old daughter of Jenny, um, has a lot of conversations with herself about, you know, why do old people go on living past the point where it's tolerable for them and everyone else? What will I do when mum is old? What will my children do when I'm old? Mm. It raises the question of euthanasia. Mm. It also raises the question of is in fact an old person better cared for within the family confines when people are trying to bring up 
kids, they're trying to run careers, they're trying to run a home. Yes. Most women nowadays, of course, work, which adds, adds to the, to the pressure. It's, it's a very important book because I think um, increasingly, because of medical care, there are these, st statistically, there would be more old people in, the, right. in ratio to young people. So it's, it's a wonderful and important book. And she Thank writes you for choosing so well. It. She writes so well. Can we have your second book? Oh, my second book is also by a woman writer. And this is A Case of Knives by Candia McWilliam. In fact, um, when I'm rehearsing a play, I don't read any novels at all. Why? It's very difficult to prevent yourself from absorbing, absorbing the style of the novelist, which is in conflict with the style of the script on which you're working. Um, most actors tend to just, you know, fiddle about and do crosswords while they're filming or maybe read bits of newspapers, but it's very difficult to actually get your teeth into a book. So um, this was the first book after I'd actually, the first book I read, after I'd actually finished writing my own and it made me wish I'd never written a single word <laughs> ever. Well, you, re you really enjoyed it. I was just so impressed by this young woman's technique, her skill, her vocabulary. I mean, it sent me running to the dictionary three <laughs> or four times a page. Well, Candy was actually a guest on the uh, oh, programme and uh, one of our first guests. And it was a highly acclaimed novel. Um, but some of the critics, uh, unfairly in my opinion, said that, you know, actually it was so Baroque and, and uh, that, that it, it was counterproductive and, and difficult to follow. You, uh, very unfair, I agree, but you oh, clearly didn't. I think it. so. It's a book that mm. does demand concentration. I mean, you can't read it, you know, when there's and television casually, blaring no. in the background or whatever. Um, it requires a lot of uh, attention. But and what she... is the story? In, in terms of the story, what appealed to you about that? Well, again, um, <coughs> very much like Margaret Forster, and I suppose because I'm an actor, I'm very impressed by writers who are able to put themselves right inside the skin of different people. And like Margaret's book is written through the eyes of Hannah and Jenny, this is written through the eyes of Lucas, who is a homosexual surgeon, through the eyes of Anne, oh, Cora, first of all. Cora, who's very difficult to describe, she's a sort of um, rather nubile, beautiful ne'er-do-well, who's actually looking for a father for her baby. I mean, she knows who the father is, but she wants um, her Someone nest a little in. bit, <laughs> yes, her, her nest a little bit, well, uh, better feathered than the actual father could provide. And Anne, who's an extraordinary sort of um, woman of the world, rather cold, rather elegantly dressed, um, Scottish, rather removed, rather distant. When you were reading it, Maris, just the way you were describing it, do you go into character when you're reading it? You have two very different women there, and I, I saw you almost acting the part. Is this the difficulty of, for, an, for uh, uh, an actor reading a book, that they actually become the character in a certain sense? It was just the way you were describing oh dear, them. You were almost, no, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful because I think maybe you get an extra dimension. Um, I don't think so. I think any good novel will put the reader in that position. I mean, when I'm reading Lucas, obviously I identify with this homosexual surgeon who's very <laughs> elegant and wealthy. When I'm reading Hal, who's his boyfriend, I'm very sympathetic to him too. But that's just the mark of a good writer. I mean, she is so immediate. And what's so brilliant about the book is it's almost like a sort of horror story come thriller. And through each person's eyes, through each of these chapters uh, about each of these people, you begin to piece together a bit more of the jigsaw. It's a beautifully plotted book. Yes, very clever. Beautifully plotted. planned, mm. very, very polished. And it just left me gasping every now and again. I just thought, I don't know how I've had the courage to write a book of my own when there's somebody like this writing. Her skill is extraordinary. Well, Candy would be delighted to hear you <laughs> saying this. And I did enjoy it good, enormously. Good. Shall we move on to your third book? Yes, my third book is not a new book, unlike Have the Men Had Enough and A Case of Knives. It's a book that was written in 1962 by Aldous Huxley, and it's called Island. And the reason I've chosen it is rather perhaps an odd one. I should state at the outset that I do have a faith, but I don't belong to any church. But I do go to Monday night meetings at St James's Church, Piccadilly, and they have a whole variety of talks there. It can vary from um, 
Buddhists talking, a very general talk about the art of loving, a talk about druids, a talk about ley lines, you know, the energy yes. lines uh, that are centred on... And how did that lead you to the book? Well, um, the last meeting I went to, the young man who was talking in a very general way, a very warm way, a very honest way, the, the, the talk was called The Art of Loving. Oh, and I think An all-embracing title. An all-embracing <laughs> title, and I think lots of us have got a lot to learn from, from loving, whatever sort of uh, uh, standpoint we have, uh, whether we're married or not, whether we're homosexual or heterosexual, whatever. And um, attached to the various sheets of paper which informed you where he was giving these talks all over England, um, was a list of books that he has found interesting or useful. They were things like uh, Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving, yes. uh, a lot of Herman Hesse and Arts and, and this, Goldman. This, this book was This particular. book was on the list. Would you read an excerpt? I would, it? and then I'll tell you yes, why please. it, it uh, has now become one of my favourite books. Good being is in fact knowing who we are. And in order to know who in fact we are, we must first know moment by moment who we think we are and what this bad habit of thought compels us to feel and do. A moment of clear and complete knowledge of what we think we are, but in fact are not, puts a stop for the moment to the Manichaean charade. If we renew until they become a continuity, these moments of the knowledge of what we are not, we may find ourselves all of a sudden knowing who in fact we are. Concentration, abstract thinking, spiritual exercises, systematic exclusions in the realm of thought. Asceticism and hedonism, systematic exclusion in the realms of sensation, feeling and action. But good being is in the knowledge of who in fact one is in relation to all experiences. So be aware, aware in every context, at all times and whatever, creditable or discreditable, pleasant or unpleasant, you may be doing or suffering. This is the only genuine yoga, the only spiritual exercise worth practicing. Is that the essence, the, the, that search for self-knowledge, is that the essence of the, the book's attraction? Yes, I think actually um, for you. the book is divided really into two quite clear sections. It's a story of Will Farnaby who is shipwrecked on an island called Parla, an island that doesn't exist. And the people of Parla are the ultimate in what human beings could be. In fact, it's his companion volume to Brave New World. This is the positive side of the Brave New World. Children are brought up with an understanding of psychology from about the age of four and five. Um, there is no capitalism. So it's, it's a utopia. Do you, it's, I mean, it's, it's a spiritual written, utopia. It's a spiritual utopia. It was written in the 60s um, when, in a way, we were all uh, possibly more idealistic. Do you, do you feel that a utopia is still possible, in a nutshell, before you move on to your next book? I think utopia is even more necessary today than it was in the 60s. In fact, a book like this shows us how much we've lost that dream and in fact not a dream, the reality of people actually functioning on the positive, caring, loving sides of their nature instead of functioning on the money-grabbing, mercenary, acquisitive sides. So it's essential reading book. for the 80s as well as the 60s. I think so. Right. That's, that's marvellous. Next, our next book, Jane. I, we could spend the entire programme on that. We could. It's a lovely book, <laughs> it's isn't marvellous. it? It's yeah. marvellous. Well, this is Fell Walking with Re Wainwright. <laughs> we couldn't have a greater contrast. So tell us about Fell well, Walking with Wainwright. This is really my book of dreams. I mean, I'm a novice Fell Walker. I was only introduced to walking in the Lake District about five years ago. So I've only, in fact, done about two of these walks. And do you have two favourites there? Yes, I do. Um, what are I they? walked from Buttermere past the beautiful waterfall called Scale Force, which I think has a drop of about 100 feet. And I walked to the top, or rather scrambled to the top, of Red Pike. It's, um, I think it's 2,479 feet. And it was a beautiful day down in the valley of Buttermere and Crummock Water. So and how long, is that a very long walk? 
Um, it's only about six miles. I mean, Wainwright... For me, that's a long walk. Is it? Yeah, oh, it's no, not for me. I mean, nine or 13 miles is Well, you're making walk. me feel dreadful. Oh, but, I mean, this is serious walking. This is, uh, you know, walking, the boots yes. and the red socks and the rucksack. And why with do you like doing that? Is it an antidote to the busy, noisy world of theatre, which is so intrusive in a way? Is, Absolutely. Is that, it's the piece that you like. I find that as I get older and the longer I live in London, the more precious my time becomes in the country. The solitude and also when you're faced with these hills you're really put into your proper place you know that's its charm do, do you, the, clearly that is not a book you could take with you when you're walking do you is there a small guide yes. version of it oh, the original which you would walk with absolutely the this is really more a, um, a coffee table book because mm. some of the photographs by Derry Brabs are absolutely stunning every time I look through it I'm right back there it's almost as good as being there not quite. you're making me so enthusiastic <laughs> about it I think I'm going to give up walking a mile a day and do six miles well what what's is so lovely is the sense of achievement when you get to the top and a lot of people who don't know about walking think walking up is more difficult it isn't it's the walking down that's the I'm agony I'm inspired <laughs> what is the law your last choice can, can I just briefly yes. say that the little books um, that Wainwright initially um, published you can put in your pocket and they're dotted about with lovely drawings of his of like stone cairns or foxes and I mean he's very sort of gruff he doesn't try and seduce you into walking in the Lake District he presumes because you've bought <laughs> these books you like it anyway he's very military you know splendid days full march it's not for the faint heart I am inspired <laughs> Despite my faint heart. And what is the. Well, this is Mother Madonna Whore. By title. Isn't it? By Estella Very Weldon. Well, this is rather, rather a cheat, actually, because it's not by my bedside. You couldn't possibly keep a book like this by your bedside. Um, it's written... Uh, Estella Weldon is a psychoanalyst, and she's had over 20 years' experiences with. Um, female perversions, I think it would be fair to. Um, call it um, but the, the thing that actually caught my eye apart from the wonderful title is the idealization and denigration of motherhood and like a lot of people who must have picked up this book this was actually given to me by um, now you're a mother yourself of a right. son. did you find it instructive in any way well the thing is danger areas well not really in that um, I hope I don't have any psychological perversions no as such. no but what is interesting about it is that it shocked me when I read the idealization and denigration of motherhood and the whole book is based on the premise that because Freud initiated psychoanalysis um, that most women didn't suffer the same kind of perversions as men he thought because Which he... is very unfair in a way. I mean, maybe this, exactly. to some extent, rebalances. Exactly. And we're always thinking of incest, with which I think the book deals, exactly. uh, in the context of men. But actually, you know, women have can ruthlessly seduce their male children. Well, I think it's only fair to, to make that yes, balance. Yes, I agree. Because yes. we've, we've been so easily swept along by feminism. Yes. And actually, like Estella says, that women who have had bad childhoods because their mothers have been unnurturing or uncaring are quite capable of visiting the same kind of abuse on their own children or um, a, a male pervert will actually use a female and um, the object of male perversion is kind of aimed at but female perversion is sexually is that's not true female female perversion is self-inflicted it can be anorexia it can be bulimia it can be any kind of uh, self-destructive things um, and also because women um, who have had extremely um, disparate childhoods and violent childhoods see their own body as an image of their mother's body. So in turn, they will cause havoc to the offspring of that body. So I think it's a very important book because it, it stops us idolising yes, motherhood. Yes, and, and constantly attacking men. Jane, it's been really very, very fascinating listening to all your books. Thank you so much. You. And a recap of the books by Jane Lapatera's bedside. Have the men had enough? Margaret Forster's new novel about coping with a senile relative, chosen for the second time by a guest on this program, published by Chatto and Windus. A Case of Knives by Candy McWilliam, her first and highly acclaimed novel about a homosexual surgeon, now out in paperback from Abacus. Island by Aldous Huxley, his view of utopia and a companion to his classic novel Brave New World, published by Triad Grafton. 
the classic Wainwright on fell walking, Alfred Wainwright's beautifully illustrated book of his favorite walks in the Lakeland, published by Michael Joseph in their Mermaid book series. And finally, Mother Madonna Whore, a feminist look at the role of women as mothers by Estella V. Weldon, which is published by Free Association Books. Next week, I will be finding out what books Alan Plater, the creator of such TV classics as Zed Cars and A Very British Coup, has by his bedside. Until then, good night. If you'd like a list of the books featured in this month's programmes and some more information about Books by My Bedside, please write to Books by My Bedside, P.O. Box 1322, London North West 1, 3HS.